You were expecting a big introduction. Can you introduce yourself? <laughs> no, that sounds great. Uh, as far as I know, this group is called Boss. I am in the right place, right? Yes. Um, uh, I'm excited to be here for my first time. I'll give you a piece of pizza if you identify my twin in the room. Um, uh, I'm sort of a, I don't know, I'm not a full-time coder um, in the general sense that I think most of y'all are. I do spend half my day coding in some form or fashion. I started when I was eight. I'm 35 now, so I've been coding for 27 years. Anybody do Logo? Um, logo, the little turtle that you program around. That's what I started on Then went to basic. Tried Pascal, hated it. Took most of high school off and then got back in college. Uh, but most of my stuff work-wise started to be more forms of script. Um, uh, I know that I lose a lot of credibility with this group showing up with a Windows computer. Um, I, I thought it'd be even more fun to add PowerPoint. Um, and then you, I'm trying you to. Do need some therapy, I'm and then I'm going to try to regain status with my cool R shit. So. Uh, but even for more fun, um, I work at Level. We just built a building behind Wolf Camera. Um, I manage portfolios of all types. Uh, I won't get into that much. I'll save that for another discussion, but I did want to say where we are. Um, come by and visit anytime. we got a neat little new space. Um, for fun, I uh, blog at timelinesportfolioblogspot.com. These are stats. And in the, you know, you know I'm true open source when I have 74,000 page views and less than $10 revenue. Uh, so maybe that'll gain some status. Uh, I've been operating it since about December of 2010. I started it more as a journal, um, but I also coincidentally, I started really hitting R hardcore. Um, then switching most of my stuff from Excel and VBA. Um, R is so much better. Uh, but the reason I was able to do that is the tremendous number of packages uh, that these guys have done. There's some um, guys out of Chicago that have built some amazing packages that just make it so easy that even I can do it. <laughs> Um, I tweet at Timely Portfolio if anybody wants to interact there. Um, and then starting to put all my my files there, GitHub. Um, my sense, at least in my case, it can turn just a normal literate person into a superhero. If you're looking for a book, um, this is the, this is the killer. Just came out about three months ago. Um, the R, I think most of the people blogging and talking about R are not professional developers. Um, so a lot of it's just sort of reading a guy that just spits out script. I'm in the same sense. None of my stuff is public. Uh, I mean, besides the blog, that I'm not, all my stuff is for my own use. So we all know the very difficult task of taking it from that to put it in the public space. Um, so I've not made that transition. This guy hopefully will help me get there. Um, for more loss of credibility, I added transitions into this. Um, these are, uh, did y'all like that? Um, uh, so I'm still building back up. This is the number of packages. Uh, it's not my own work, but it is an R chart. Um, it's very typical of some of the stuff. But you can see there are over 2,100 packages now. This was through, I didn't have time to update the chart, and this is not my own, but it's pretty easy. That's a log chart, and see it's almost logarithmic, the amount of packages that have been contributed since 2001. R, I think, dates mainly back to 97, and it's just getting to a status that I would say is mature, um, and that you can really use it in legitimate, um, harder core, more intense purposes. Um, one more animation just for fun. <coughs> Revolution are the people trying to make money off of open source. They actually do neat things like sponsor all the um, R meetups around the world. I'm, I'm going to keep plugging it. I'm going to try to get one for Birmingham. Um, but these are just some of the uses. They run a competition for R in business. Um, and you can see direct marketing in flight forecasting system, mining Twitter, um, even. I have no idea. Forge an ideal steel plant, so a lot of the operational type stuff, real time analytics, um, all the way down to this guy that sort of, um, it's a, a latex or tex um, improvement, uh, but it's an R package. So uh, a lot of people have, <coughs> not a lot of people, but what I've thought is really interesting is some people, uh, academics, professors, 
have built their research all in R and then spit out the code, the data, and allow very easy reproducibility. Um, so one package I'll look at is one of those instances, and it's pretty nice in that you know generally a lot of that stuff is closed. Once somebody does it, it's impossible to replicate. Um, so that's a, a really neat function of R. Um, but all sorts of uses. I mean, back to the packages. Um, the uh, you'll see it in everything from journalism to finance, um, corporate finance, accounting, marketing. Um, see a lot of. Uh, web um, starts business vis any visual graphical visualization uh, a lot of times will be in R um, you'll see some biochemistry stuff out there you'll see some mapping and GIS stuff um, I'm going to do one example of that because it's it's the thing that I could do that is most different from what I do on a day-to-day -day basis to try to give you opposite ends of the spectrum um, there's that neat little animation again um, this is, I think, the proudest <coughs> moment of R. At least every presentation that has R, that somebody talks about R, they almost point to this article. It's from 09 New York Times, um, and it's in the tech section. But it's a really good article, even though it's a little dated now. But just to um, stick with the theme, it's sort of the hello world of R. Um, this article in uh, New York Times, something far better. Um, are these Vimeo sets from the lady Amanda Knox um, who talks about how they use R in their graphics departments. Uh, there's evidently some visualization award conference that just ended um, and New York Times always wins um, almost invariably over the entire spectrum so this is a really neat way that that article is neat but them showing how they actually use it is even um, there's a, a neat set of graphics if anybody's into baseball stats where they took R and analyzed all the pit, major league pitches by type, slider, fastball, and then they have this really nice visualization. Um, uh, so we can look for that later. This is the most beautiful map that I've ever seen, I think, and it's all done in R. Um, a guy at the at box here, February 2nd. ggplot is one of the main visualization packages. A lot of the R stuff comes out of Auckland, New Zealand, um, and there's sort of that's that's the mecca. And a lot of people, um, a lot of good work is coming out of this. This ggplot 2 package, which has just been updated, is from a guy named Hadley Wickham, um, who's at N New Zealand. But if you search YouTube, I'm going to. I don't know how y'all normally distribute, but I'll, I'll distribute show notes or presentation notes with references. Uh, but I figured y'all don't want to spend all your time writing down web links. So I'll, I'll spit those out. But what this is, is it's uh, the London uh, bicycle lines, and then he overlaid the pollution. Uh, so the redder areas, the thicker the line, the more uh, intense the usage. It's just a pretty chart. Um, and it's done in R, so R does have the capability to do all <coughs> sorts of things. I am not a math major, um, so uh, a lot of this academic stuff that seems really interesting, I'd like to be able to recreate, or if nothing else, a professor, once they do it, then moves on, and they actually forget they wrote a paper sometimes. Uh, my old boss contacted an MIT professor about a paper he wrote. It was 10 years later, and he didn't even remember that he wrote it. Um, so when, you get, when you're trying to reproduce what might be high-quality work, or update it to new market <coughs> conditions um, if you're not capable of doing the math. I mean, I think you did the AI um, course. Did anybody else do the AI course? And I think a lot of that's linear programming that's all available. And R, genetic algorithms, optimizations, all sort of things. But the thing about um, R and finance, um, or finance in general, is what I've noticed is the smarter the person, the more likely they fail. Um, because we're so accustomed to being right uh, that we can't acknowledge that markets change and random events do occur and when they do occur they can wipe you out and once you've wiped out it takes a long time to rebuild um, so that's just sort of my uh, my, my own little thing was the, the guy that spoke about open street maps is he here? He's not here. He's not here. Just for fun I thought I'd... Um, you get caught for soccer game. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> so there's a package, um, and I'll try to walk through it. Kind of line. I don't want to walk through line by line, but um, a couple lines of code. You can pull up a map of the southeast, open street map. Um, I just kind of throw in these things. 
ways. I'm going to kind of touch on different things. There are multiple ways to code in R. One is old school command line. Emacs has an ESS <coughs> add-on uh, that a lot of people like. Eclipse has a, I think it's stat ET, but it might be wrong in the name. If you're more familiar with other IDEs and want to just add a plugin. Um, R comes shipped with a, at least in all packages, but give it to Windows, it only comes up by default in Windows. Linux, you have to specify the GUI option, uh, but this is pretty, pretty straight, plain vanilla. Um, you do a script, and I don't know. Uh, one example I did was plot um, thousand random variables. Usually, Control R is what you get to run code. So there you go. It's ugly, but it's fairly powerful. All the distributions they have over 20 different distributions, binomial, um, all the different uh, higher math functions. But that's as close as I'll get to command line, I think, because it's integrated. Um, the neat thing about R is um, the ability to export into everything from JPEG to PDF to SVG um, with one line or less. So uh, that's pretty cool. Um, so you have all those options. The newest and the best is, um, uh, at least by my, yes, all this is cross-platform um, in true open source fashion. Uh, RStudio is the the newest, but also the best um, uh, that I resisted for at least six to twelve months, um, and I finally converted to RStudio just because it's incredibly powerful. So here's that chart. Um, you know, nothing special, but that is all the data from OpenStreetMaps is far better than I could map any other way, um, especially um, in you know sort of the competitors I would say would be Excel or the Google Maps um, through the Google spreadsheets. They're just not that pretty. Um, they're getting there, but they're just not there yet. Uh, but then you can actually run stat stuff in there. Um, you have 2,000 U.S. Census. Leave it to the R guys. There's a um, package uh, with all that data and shape files. Um, so let's just run this and see if it's running. They've started on the 2010, but most of the examples that I played with were 2000. So I just um, I told Josh, my brother, that I uh, very dumbly or stupidly tried to update to the newest version of R this morning, so I lost some of my, uh, my stuff. Um, but you'll see here, this is what I'm talking about with the export. You can save plot as image or PDF or copy to a clipboard. Um, but here's all the different file types. You can do all that through the command line, um, but it's, it's so much easier just to do it here. Uh, but SVG is an incredibly compelling option for me, um, and that um, uh, that's uh, it's hard to get that access. I mean, I know Excel doesn't export to SVG, or at least not well. And uh, that's that's powerful, and especially if you're going to include this into some other work, which um, which is pretty neat. Uh, there's a really um, cool. Uh, Paul Morell is one of the big graphics guys in ours, and the two biggest conferences or the two most compelling conferences are one, use, use R, which is for the entire community. Um, that's in Nashville this year, if anybody really gets into it between now and then. June 12th to 15th, I've not been, but seeing the slides and the presentations are amazing. Paul Morell takes a PDF university map and converts it into an SVG, all with R, and then he, uh, he adds overlays and all, all sorts of pretty amazing things uh, for a stats package. Um, I couldn't do it any other way. It's nice that I know R because it makes it very easy. Um, so that's that map. This is the log density of population by area. Um, so you know, the denser the population, the more purple it gets. There are better ways to do this. Um, I just lost the capability in my unfortunate incident this morning. Um, the uh, one way, and there's a this is another um, thing, and I'm going to try to see if it works. What I wanted to show was I was going to reproduce that map, but in an interactive option, or interactive form. This um, Java GUI, um, it's all built in Java, so it's, it's as cross platform as could be. Uh, it's another. Um, deal and what I want to do is reproduce that data but when I'm loading the census data it screws up so I thought I'd live code just to uh, again try to restore the credibility from, from earlier um, uh, 
deducer spatial is that interactive package. It, it, it does way more than just mapping. Um, but to me, the, the neat thing is map. So if I do spatial plot builder here, um, you'll see down here, open street map. Um, and watch what happens when you zoom in. Um, it starts to get prettier and prettier. Um, and it's all free. You can use this to then do things like I did with the uh, with this map, uh, but because it's interactive, you can on the fly change um, to log density. I and mean, one thing that I, one example that I had was above and beyond that, take it then by race, and you can look at demographic um, distribution of race, uh, universe. I mean, education, income. All those different things, um, but here just for fun, let's go all the way down into our current location. Um, that's Lake Shore, there's Valley. Uh, but there are a lot of shape files that are also in packages. Uh, one of the neatest was the LA places and bus routes um, that are in here, and you can just pull them in at will. Uh, where are we? Beacon Parkway East, right? So, oh, Emma. Right here. Anyways, <clears throat> so to pull in that data, you can see polygons, pulls in shape files, um, but you can also do bubbles, text, whatever. Um, but then you can interact with the ggplot package um, to do just your normal analysis, um, test, uh, plot builder. It, it basically gives every type of plot you could ever hope to generate. Um, with all the different overlays and different things. But like I said, I thought the map example was so different from what I do on a normal day-to-day -day basis, so I wanted to include that. And uh, I want this to be interactive. Don't, let, don't make me talk the entire time. So that's, that's spatial thing in our specific um, th interface. This is, I mean, it's through the R, this R Right. Um, that's a good point. Um, and that uh, CRAN is the major host of all the R packages. But if you want to look for R project .org, uh, I will say that the you know they 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 named it R far longer way before Google, so it's incredibly difficult to search for R things because <laughs> when you put R in there. I mean, the letter doesn't help. You put it in quotes, Google's starting to figure it out. It's getting much better. There's a, I think there's an rseek.org, um, and it just specifically searches our text. But here's all this, and this is where you can get all the downloads. Um, uh, the, jan the journal is pretty interesting. Um, it's free, uh, unlike most expensive journals out there. Uh, you can see download R, and these are all the mirrors, but I was going to try to show you all the different releases, but so Linux, Mac, Windows, and it, I, I made the comment earlier about Linux. I started Linux too early, and I've been turned off ever since. <laughs> um, and then now I know it's easy, but I went through some painful moments. Um, R, I think I started at the right time, and that it really is plug and play, um, as far as I know, on all three major platforms. Um, it's <coughs> incredibly simple and easy. Um, How big of an install is it? Is uh, let's just see. No. Um, really I mean, it, where is it going to tell me? 45 megabytes for the that basic package. That basic package, I think, includes uh, about 2,000 plus functions. So you can go a long way with just the basic packages, but then you add the 2,100 or so other packages. Um, <laughs> Similar to, and I'm sure y'all know, our. Um, you, you said it's a bit of a replacement for SAS. Uh, SAS yeah. Stata, um, but R was built to replicate an open source fashion S. Yes. Uh, but the other one, SAS is a, a stats program. Stata is another one. Uh, there's but like the file. SPSS. SPSS. I've, I've got some data for that's kind of. It comes with a bunch of SAS files and well, stuff. Will it actually use those? Or, uh, well, it will use SAS data, but not SAS 
code parameters. Yeah, and you can. I mean, really you'll play. see here when I pull data. Where is it? Data. Um, dang it. There's a way to pull in data and gives you all those options. Um, okay. Uh, I think it was that thing I closed. Uh, that data viewer. But pretty much anything you can do or get a package for in SAS is available here, and way more is available here. So that's just what that's basic. Um, but you can see stats on I mean, SPSS, SAS, <coughs> DBase. Uh, anybody use Hadoop or big data? They're started to. I'm not familiar with that, but I know that R does interact with big data. There are a couple of neat little slideshows on that. What, uh, what are the closed sources? Stata, SPSS, most of the ones we've just mentioned. One, one thing you do need to keep in mind as a general statement is that uh, it does require all of its data to be in memory. If there are extensions to go beyond that, then it will go there. Right. Um, most of it is in memory, which makes it quick, but when you're dealing with big data, it makes it fun. So, um, if y'all are familiar with source forwards, there's an R equivalent for package development. Well, more importantly, you've got that 30 some odd gigs of real RAM. Yes. But if you got it, it'll do. so much memory and it doesn't work anymore. So how much memory are you talking about? He says, well, it works fine with three terabytes, but it doesn't work with four. It's <laughs> like, then you got me beat. I ain't got three terabytes around here. So. I was going to show you all where you can get all the code. Uh, most of the time, these guys will develop on R, uh, and I can't find it, but I was going to show you the, the source. One other neat little thing is uh, there's an R, well, uh, if you just do our graphical manual. Uh, most of it's self-documenting, and most um, files have help built in. Um, but uh, if you're really looking for different ways to do graphs, uh, you'll notice 36,000 graphs, and those all come out of the examples with the packages. Um, so pretty much anything you want to look at. But um, let's just zoom out. Um, and then you can look through all the different packages by the type of graph you might want to generate. So. That's another option, but two, what I think everybody wants to hear about is how to make easy money, right? Um, yeah, please. No, you know, it's, always, it's always the dream of, um, I think, all of us just to, uh, to find an easy method to make money, and then we, don't, we can code for fun. Um, but the hard thing about it is uh, markets change, environments change, and what happens is part of that being smart again, the smarter you are, the more tools you have, the more you potentially curve it to a specific environment. And my biggest struggle with what I do is finding more data because the U.S. has the best source of data, but the U.S. is a huge anomaly with very limited history. Um, and that the U.S. went from you know, a colony to world power. And there's very, if we only think our markets are typical of all other markets, which did the reverse in other countries, but we don't have the data set for, we might have a huge glaring oversight. So it's nice to be able to um, pull in things and just for fun, uh, I got this to work. So, any Ruby guys, um, there's Apple Chart with. 07 through. Uh, there are different ways to do it. And of course, you can add all sorts of different features, but you can pull it through Ruby. You can pull it through. Uh, the best integration with R is C, C, and Fortran, just based on its legacy. Um, but it does integrate well with um, uh, Ruby, uh, with Python. Uh, it works better with Python, uh, but even with Excel, which I know y'all don't use um, because it's just Windows. Um, it works really well. Um, and there's a very neat little thing where you can send data back. Um, and the old way I think I mentioned when I was trying to test an idea or a system was to um, um, 
supposed to do in Excel, which is fine when you have one data set that doesn't change. But when you have when you want to test across multiple markets, indices, asset classes, uh, it becomes very difficult to copy and paste all that data. Um, there are, if you're familiar with Bloomberg or any of the other data sources, there are packages that can pull it in and out. But Bloomberg's 25 grand. I have it, but I like to know that you don't need it to, to make money. The simpler, the better, the generally. Um, so in that vein, let's see. Let's just do this for fun. Uh, has anybody done any systems building, or you have? What do you mean by system? Building? In terms of uh, trying to build a system that tells you when to buy or sell, or when. I have for Bitcoin. Okay. <laughs> there was a neat article on that. I wish yeah. I would have brought it. Yeah. I, but not anything market-wise. Okay. Um, I mean, there's there's very basic things. Uh, uh, Tom and I had this discussion. When you read a book about it, they make it seem so simple. But if they haven't tested it, just like you would test your code, unit test, run it across multiple time frames, environments, um, do walk forward analysis where you don't know what's coming, even though you have the full data set, do it on a limited portion and then run it forward, um, then it's not good. I mean, there are all sorts of different things that you can come up with that are very stupid or basic that appear to make a lot of money and might make money for 10 years and then one day can wipe you out. Um, so the hard part is trying to keep it simple and also understand that the better systems usually are less right. So I think most of us are accustomed to being right a lot. Um, but if your system is 90% right, you're very likely selling options, which gives you that whole blow up in one day environment. So you can go for 10, 15 years and be loving it, um, but I can't. It's sort of the, the guys over at Cook and Bonham run a mutual fund here. Uh, they use a very good example. It's like Will of Fortune. The longer you play, the more likely you're going to bankrupt. No matter how big you get that pot, it's one spin away from zero, and it takes a lot. You don't get to play again. Um, and that's similar in life, I and mean, we all have limited lifespans. Um, so you want to avoid that <coughs> bankrupt slot. So very simply, and, and I'm a, 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 so kind of how you do it in R, and I'll do it live, code. Control R does not work in R studio, um, uh, which is weird, because every other one allows that. Uh, let me start over, just so you can see kind of the, the data that you see when you uh, start it up. And, Packages when I mean you have all the base packages and you can tell them to load by default other packages if you like them. Um, you'll notice it kept my history there, but it did not. You can save all your workspace down here. So your workspace loaded. I leave it blank. Um, but here's what: when you require, you can do two ways: library quant mod or require quant mod. Um, I think Tom's going to talk about a little bit of the time series functions in R and pandas. Zoo and XDS are the best sources of time frame. Um, packages and R, TTR pulls in all sorts of rules. Um, I'm going to do one that uh, I've, I've used with decent success, but it's not good. Uh, but just as a, a very simple method, uh, you can get symbols, um, DJI, and from the Fed, you can get uh, Dow Jones back, data back to. 1896. Um, so nice to be able to get that data. 1896 Um And let's run it and see if I typed it correctly. No, I did not. Is it 1986 or 1896? 1896. Um, it's, it's one of the longest sets of data, certainly the longest set of data you can get for free, uh, which is the Dow Jones back to 1896 plot. Um, uh, and this is an ugly plot, but just to prove how easy it is. Um, this is sort of that object-oriented notion that plot works with almost every set of, I mean, if you notice that R norm that I use, it's a very different sort of data. And let's just look at the data ahead. <coughs> R is vector-based. Um, I, I won't get into that unless y'all really want to. But this is the index, uh, date, form. This is the closing price. Um, the 
if I were using less history, you can get most of the stuff from Yahoo <coughs> Finance with that same get symbols command. Um, but it's just limited to the S&P to 1950, uh, the Nikkei to 1970-something. So you still get a nice broad set of data. Um, but the longer the better. Uh, but generally when you're testing, you want to take a shorter period because you don't want to waste your best data set. Uh, but if you do plot DJIA, um, there it is. Um, if you want to put, I think this command is true, but they're all different. And this is a sort of a standard command set, and this is how they look. It is case sensitive. Whatever I did is wrong, but I want to show a better plot anyways. So here's the, the guys that did the, the time series stuff, and then the guys that, is that my time? No. Um, I do want to get to time because uh, you know, he's got a lot of neat things to show. So. Uh, performance analytics, if we, um, let's just say we want to chart performance summary, but let's do it by month, um, since there's so much data, the daily takes a long time, um, DJIA, and what this did, uh, it auto-assigned that to uh, the time series object, that's a vector, um, and then let's see, Y log, and this will make it a little prettier. Oops, I gotta do one more thing that it accepts. And I'm screencasting this if anybody really cares to watch it again. I'll send it out. Um, we're gonna take the daily change um, of, well, let's do this. DJI.monthly. And this is how easily a lot of this stuff is. DJI. Um, what we'll do is run. And now you'll see that this is um, in monthly form rather than daily form, which is a little bit easier to deal with. So then we can run this on monthly, and it'll give us that monthly return stream. Um, and let's see, this is, if you're using this package, this is very important and discrete. So it's uh, not geometric. And I gotta be plural. So this is gonna do a um, couple things. That's the monthly. The high low and close aren't. Um, if you'll notice on that data there that. The two monthly function makes it into a high, open high low close, which is your standard form, but they're all the same. Um, well, no, it's taken in a monthly form, it's taken the high daily, so it does change it. But this is a neat little chart. I mean, you can see this is the monthly returns, and this is drawdown. Um, drawdown is my favorite measure. I think very few people pay as much attention to it as I think should, because this is the bankrupt slot. I mean, you're not. 1929, you lose 90% of your money. I'd say that's bankrupt. So even if you start with, I don't know, a billion dollars and you lose 90%, you're still much better off than I am right now. But that's a painful loss. And uh, I would say it's, risk, it's a ruin. So the whole thing I'm trying to do is reduce drawdown or reduce my chance of ruin. Um, just for fun, you know, there's all these very difficult uh, or very convoluted, sophisticated methods. Um, so just for fun, I thought it'd be interesting to do a function that all it is, um, it takes uh, a set of data and it only decides if you're up or down for the day and then it adds that over some cumulative period. Um, so cut is what I call it, count up or down. Um, and what you can see is you get decent results. So let's just run CUD. Um, now let's do something different. Since Dow's so long, um, let's do the S&P just as another example. Um, get symbols. Uh, this will be from uh, Yahoo Finance this time. And I know that it's 1950, but just for fun, I always do 1896 because that's the longest data set that's out there so far for free. Um, uh, two, it fills in 
um, to now, but just if you wanted to do two, uh, just as an example, sys.date gives me that. Um, so this will pull from Yahoo Finance S&P 500 data. Um, Yahoo Finance uh, for indices requires this little carrot. And um, so R allows you to write functions, which uh, sort of, um, so this is that little simple function with a couple lines of code, run it. So what it now does is it assigns this, this function. Um, so when I run on here, um, just for fun, here is that code, but uh, plot does not know how to immediately handle the time series object, so in this case we need to specify the close, which is the form. Um, so this is what concerns me about all the US data, is that you had a rental phenomenon really back in 1996, which you do have the unfortunate event of depression to remind you that things aren't always so rosy. Um, but uh, here, even though it looks really bad, it's only a drawdown of about 50%. So 50% is painful. But there's also very often um, uh, an EK being the most recent where drawdown is 80, 90 percent, and that is, uh, like I said, particularly devastating. Um, so, if we wanted to run CUD on GSBC um, and equals, I don't know, 200, let's see if this works. Uh, you'll see the one. Um, uh, one for positive for the day, zero for negative for the day. Um, if we want to extend it farther, we can run sum. And you'll notice I'm not assigning uh, the assignment. This can be equals, but um, that's, I don't know, more clear. And there's certain cases, very specific cases, where equals does not mean assign. And that's all in that book. I won't get into it. It's it's very. I have not run into an instance where they treated it differently, but they can. Um, so here's uh, let's see, run some and actually I can't remember. I think I used a different version because. Um, Are you explaining a little bit more clearly what your cud? formula actually sure. simulates. Sure. Um, that's a, a good thing. So why don't we look at that function, all five lines of it. Um, so see that cut um, is assigning a function. X is the, um, the, the time series object that you pass in. that sum. So let's say we've been up the last five days. If we run the sum over the five days, in this case, you're going to get a sum of five. Um, it's basically a count of up versus down days. So if we have 10 up, 10 down, and we run over 20 day period, we'll get a zero. If you have 10 up days and five down days, you will get a um, five, 10 minus five. So that's how it works. And I'm not advocating that this is something you should go invest your money in. Um, but what I'm trying to do is show how simple uh, uh, it can be. And then with very basic modifications, and it's beyond the scope of this meeting, but if anybody wants to talk about it, we can get really in depth into things that I've learned um, as you analyze all this stuff. So back to here, Tom, I'm glad he brought that up because it already does the run sum. So um, if we do, this is going to be um, in or out. Um, if it's one, it's in. Uh, let's see. One, it's in. Um, two, it's out. And because of daily, it's hard to see. But um, I think so. Uh, this, these are good markets. Uh, no longer the 
like to expand better markets, meaning that they're, they're far more likely to just go up for long really years. Better to yes, it would be a momentum-based system in terms of classification. There's a couple different momentum, which means that um, you expect some sort of autocorrelation or regression, meaning that if you have one up day, you're more likely to have the next day up, um, which does happen. Um, there's pattern recognition where you're looking for certain shapes. Um, uh, there's also mean reversion, which when one thing gets out of whack based on history, um, you, if, you, if something goes down for 20 days, uh, we, is it random or is there any sort of likelihood that you then have a, a more likely move up? And in general, markets are mean reverting, but there's the, the whole maxim that markets can stay irrational longer than you can say solvent. So, uh, you know, things seem so obvious, but they can be so obvious for long periods of time, and they can knock you out. So this, I think... Would this be one piece of feedback in a, into a large system? Yeah. So there's a lot more... Yeah, I mean, you've got, uh, you know, some analysis. people believe that price embeds all factors within that system. So that the price of the S&P incorporates all known information um, is sort of the efficient market hypothesis. That the only only thing that's not known, the only thing that is not embedded is not public or not known information. Um, so there's that whole theory which is gradually being disproven. Um, that, you know, anybody that trades for a living disproved it their first day of trading. Uh, but the academics have had a harder time wrestling with the whole notion <coughs> of um, that that this isn't true. So uh, what I was trying to do real quickly, and I'm going to let Tom take it over, but if our signal is this this CUD, um, uh, N equals 200, and that's just 200 days, but it could be 200 months. It depends on the price series that we feed it. Um, that's our signal, and what we know is 1 means in, in this very basic case, 1 means in, 0 means out. So we can then say our return is uh, our returns are the, the um, 1 means we're in, so we get the return for the day. 0 means we're out, so 0 times any return means 0. So if we take that and we add another if-else signal, now, and the hard thing about this is you never know what's going to happen tomorrow. But if I didn't lag the signal, we would have the notion, and it's one of the easiest mistakes to make. That if you get a very good result, then it's probably that you didn't lag it one day. Um, so if, or actually, we can just take. We don't even need if else because it's one zero. So lag signal k times. Um, and the easiest way, to, I guess, to see this in another form rather than the ROC form is GSPC close price today uh, minus the lag close price yesterday is the return if there are also other factors that um, slippage, meaning that you can't buy exactly on the, on the close, um, other things that you need to incorporate in a, in a more and it's something you're going to put your money on, you need to uh, uh, factor in all those things. Um, but in, in a simple form, I couldn't think of any other way to make it easier. Um, it's just a plus, so the returns. Um, let's just look to make sure they look right. Um, head uh, pulls the first five sets of data and we don't know that because we're summing over 200 days so actually that's not going to help us. <coughs> Let's do tail which are the last five pieces of data and you can see some of these returns and since they're all non-zero it means that we're in the market so let's just make sure that's correct and do a tail signal <coughs> and we're in. Um, so uh, that's uh, the easiest thing and then what you see is if we look at the merged um, with the returns that we got from the system, if we want to call them systems, and the same function, and I could have done this much easier uh, and better probably, but just for fun, let's just copy and paste. 
let's merge the uh, the, the non system with the system performance and this is where it kind of gets powerful There's the system. Uh, what you'll see is that uh, this doesn't work, um, meaning that the red line, and I didn't label it properly, but the red line is the buy and hold um, of that, equivalent of that. Um, so in that case, it doesn't work, um, and I knew that, but it's still an interesting factor in that it did keep up all the way through 1980. Um, and it had far lower drawdowns, so it's a much more pleasant experience. Um, but the system doesn't hold. You know, if, we, if we tested this in 19, uh, from 1950 to 80, it would look very nice. Um, and that it limits your drawdown to the point where the bits of finance information. The drawdown is multiplicative, and compounding on the upside is uh, exponential. So if we knew that we could reduce our drawdowns, by 50%, and if we are comfortable with 50%, we can then leverage two times. So multiplying by two then means that the compounding effect is exponential, that after the period of 30 years, two times the return does not mean two times the money. It means 20, 30, 200, 1,000 times the money. I don't know the thing, but very little increments of additional return compounded over long periods of time equal very nice results. Um, so if we can reduce our drawdown, then we can get comfortable with potentially leveraging. Uh, not too much uh, leverage is the biggest source of ruin. Um, but if you can somehow use other, uh, maybe options or derivatives that can limit your drawdown to some amount, even in a catastrophic event, then you might have a nice recipe. So I'll stop there, but if you ran this on the Nikkei, it would look very different. Um, and that's why you have to go other markets, other time frames, other asset classes before I can get comfortable. Lots of people um, are looking for that magic formula. And when it hits, you know, I can spit lots of formulas in there and it works. Um, but it needs to be robust and it needs to be well tested just like any other code does. So that's it. Um, Tom, I know, has lots of neat things to say. So.